Well, I thank you very much. Thank you, Jenny, for inviting me to be here in this beautiful place. Uh, I come from Wisconsin, where, where this morning it was 30 degrees, and the high is going to be 42 today, so just, just so you know. But um, they gave me a lot of latitude about how to approach this topic about what's new for relapsed myeloma. So I want to start by showing you a picture that gets shown at lots of conferences. Now, uh, you heard from Craig, uh, we've got some very good initial treatments now. And it, one of the best things about working in myeloma for a number of years is it's really common now to see people who had initial treatment and not get, need to get anything else for seven, eight, even nine years. And so that's really happening now, much more than it ever did. But most people with myeloma are going to have a relapse at some point. And unfortunately, some people are going to have more than one. So let's talk a little bit about what, what that really means. Uh, we're going to talk about if you've had multiple relapses, what you should be potentially thinking about for treatment. We also want to talk about CAR-T a little bit. And then what are some of the new things that are on the horizon? But I want to talk a little bit about what do we mean, what kind of approaches there are for relapse. So this is a slide. Basically, if you've had myeloma and you're getting your first treatment for relapse, your providers actually have a lot of pretty good choices. Um, and so these are just to show you a couple of different trials. So this one is daratumumab with lenalidomide and dexamethasone. Big difference from lenalidomide and dexamethasone alone. This is uh, looking at carfilzomib with daratumumab. And this is looking at actually pomalidomide and Velcade versus Velcade alone. So there are really good choices for all three of these in what we call first relapse. But if you've had myeloma for a while and you've had exposure to what we talk about as three classes, meaning an imid drug like lenalidomide or pomalidomide, an antibody drug like Dara or Isituximab, and you've had a proteasome inhibitor like Velcade and carfilzomib, the results get a lot worse, unfortunately. And this is a, a study that was done uh, at a bunch of academic centers. And, and this is basically survival, unfortunately. So if you've now been exposed to these three classes and you're getting refractory, meaning you're not responding, survival is pretty bad. And so we definitely need new treatments for people who've been through uh, all of these three classes. So, if you've been told you have a relapse, it's important to know what that actually means. So we have some very formal definitions of what relapse is. And actually, I'm sorry, that's a typo that should say grams. So the International Myeloma Working Group, kind of the Bible, if you will, for myeloma, says that relapse means you have more than 0.5 grams of an M protein, you have more than 200 milligrams of monoclonal protein in a urine, a 24-hour urine, or you have more than 10 milligrams per deciliter increase in light chains. So there are a bunch of people who actually meet this and feel fine, but that's probably a little bit different from people over here. And these are people who actually have something happening. They're coming in, maybe they have a new bone fracture or anemia, or their kidneys aren't working again, or they're having high calcium. And so these people, I think we all agree, actually need to have something done right away, whereas some of these patients you can just kind of watch for a while. If somebody says you have a refractory relapse, what that means is that you are relapsing on treatment or you are within two months of stopping treatment. Now, we really think that these two groups require different approaches, but what your team should be doing if you're facing relapse is basically R&R. &R. So that's reevaluation and review. So we have to take measure of what's going on with you again. And so that means certainly running a lot of the standard tests. But if, if you never had what we call advanced imaging, something more than a bone survey, at the time of relapse, you really should ask for something more. So whether that's a whole body low dose CAT scan or an MRI or a PET scan, they really, really help us to figure out how much myeloma you have. Everybody loves bone marrow biopsies, I'm sure, <laughs> but, but they really can help us take better care of you because sometimes that's one of the only tools we have to, to figure out how much myeloma you have around. Now, this actually is turning out to be a bigger thing than, than it used to be because if you go back only to 2010, Around that time, the average survival of people with myeloma was somewhere around three to five years, so, so really pretty bad. 
Uh, nowadays, we see people with myeloma living much more than a decade. So if they come in and there's a new spot someplace, or, or what we call lesion, you have to make sure that that's really myeloma, because what we're starting to see is people who actually have something else going on. So maybe their myeloma is fine, but now they have, for example, prostate cancer, or something else that, of course, wouldn't respond at all to myeloma treatment. Then you have to review what's going on. So you heard from Craig about side effects. Unfortunately, some of these side effects can hang on. And so if you're picking new treatment, you have to think about what, you're, what, what, what the person is experiencing. Do you have really bad neuropathy? Uh, so probably don't want to get Velcade. Um, how about, how close are you to clinic? So we talked about this is the one area Huntsman for many, many hundreds of miles around. So if we ask you to come into a clinical trial that you got four visits a week, unfortunately that just may not work out for you. Do you have a caregiver? So if somebody, if something is really complicated, can somebody help you with that? Or if you're going to get a drug that means you got to get a whole lot of Benadryl, for example, maybe that's not going to work out either because you got to drive home. And finally, what about the term we like to use is comorbidities, but do you have other medical problems that we're going to have to take into account when we pick treatment? Okay. So one of the things I just want to talk to you about is a phenomenon that we're seeing more and more, and this is something called either light chain or non-secretory escape. So what does that mean? Well, you guys all probably know that we use these protein levels to diagnose myeloma, but what tends to happen as people go through relapses is they stop making as much protein. And so that's just something that we have to be aware of. So, whoops, I'm sorry, this is a person who had a very high M protein and, at, at diagnosis, so they got treated, it all went away, but now they're relapsing, and look at that M protein, it didn't change at all. So if all you were looking at was that to pay attention to, you would get faked out that something is really going on. Instead, what this person's myeloma chose to do was just elevate light chains. And that happens quite a bit as people go through uh, their myeloma uh, course. And in particular, there are some people who stop making almost pro any protein at all, and that gets very challenging for us to help figure out if something's going on. The other thing about that advanced imaging I mentioned, this is a person that I saw who came in uh, on treatment with really particularly bad back pain. Now this person has what we call compression fracture, so you can see this scooping. Instead of being like a tuna can stacked up, this is not normal, but this is an old change. This is what the person had when their myeloma was diagnosed, but they had terrible back pain. However, we did an MRI and unfortunately, what we were able to find is these holes that are myeloma, and this person unfortunately had all of their sacral vertebral body replaced by myeloma, and that's what was causing the pain. But if you had only done a bone survey, you would have missed that. Okay, so let's talk about some of those things that are available right now, plus what's coming in the future. So I'm gonna to touch upon just a few of these. We're gonna talk about CAR-T, we're gonna talk a little bit about Volantimab. I want you to take, take away from all this, there is so much in development that we are very, very excited about. And even though, as Craig mentioned, we know that most people are gonna have to deal with a relapse, we think we're going to have more and more answers for that. So why does every new treatment seem to target this B cell maturation antigen or BCMA? And that's because it's really important. Uh, for one thing, it, it helps the myeloma cells stay alive. So if you take away BCMA, those cells really can't d grow and divide and uh, multiply and even make uh, antibodies. Um, we also know that BCMA is relatively confined to B cells, and those are the cells that eventually turn into myeloma cells, and it's not really found in other places in the body, which makes it a really good target if you're developing a drug to get at that. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so, so Belantimab. So Belantimab was the first BCMA-approved therapy that we had, and basically what it does, it is an antibody connected to a drug called monomethyl aristatin F, or MMAF, and so what, what we think works primarily is that the, the, the drug binds to the myeloma cell, and then it just releases this little package of chemo into the cell, and that helps kill the myeloma cell, but there's also probably some other side effects, excuse me, uh, uh, anti-myeloma effects. Now, belantimab is kind of a, an interesting and a little bit of a drug that we don't understand. Well, I think that's the best way to say that. Oh, it only works about in one out of three patients, to be honest, if you give it by itself. 
Uh, there's lots of work trying to combine it with various drugs. That's a, a common theme in myeloma. And this is just a, a, a study on the right here where this was, com the bilantamab was combined with uh, pomalidomide and dexamethasone. So instead of 30% of patients responding, more than half did. So that's probably a good strategy. But the, but the really weird thing about bilantamab is in the third of people that respond to it, they respond really well. Uh, and so we've certainly seen people who've been on this drug for several years. Um, and if you don't respond to it, we can figure that out right away, usually within a month. Now, Craig mentioned keratopathy, which is these corneal side effects. And he's absolutely right. If you stretch out the dosing, and we, we tend to dose people every month or six weeks, you can keep the benefits and minimize the eye toxicity. One of the best things that, that our patients really like about Belantamab is it's given with no steroids, which is one of the few treatments that's like that. So people really, really, really like that. Um, let's go back to these CAR-Ts. So, so uh, Craig mentioned a little bit about this, but what's different between normal stuff and a CAR-T? So, in your body normally, if you want your T cell to go kill something, it has to have a wingman. It has to have something that we call an antigen presenting cell. Somebody that says, hey, stupid, wake up. See this little thing? You should say, I don't like that. I want to go kill it. And so not only do they show it to the T cell, but they also kind of goose it a little bit with these little purple uh, spheres saying like, Vip! You know, you need to get going, go get that thing. But in a CAR-T, what's done is to kind of remove that mechanism. So this T cell that's been engineered now recognizes this thing on its own, and it comes in pre-turbocharged. So just like Craig said, they're administered basically without needing any help to go get that, uh, that target. Now, we have two CAR-Ts that are approved right now. So on the left is what's called a BECMA or Ida cell, uh, or Ida captagene veclusal, and on the right is Silta cell or Carvicti. Um, differences are there. So the one on the, the left here has one binding site for BCMA, which is derived from a mouse. And this one has two binding sites for BCMA derived from a llama, of all things. Um, in any case, we know the, uh, Ida cell was the first one to publish data. And we know a couple of things. This is a little bit busy. But basically, the more cells they can give you, the better it seems to work. We know that the response rate overall was around in the 80% range if you had uh, the highest dose. And the time that the response lasted was around uh, 11 months. Now, if you ended up getting a complete remission, you actually did much better than that. And now your response lasted a couple of years. Now, I'm going to skip this uh, in the interest of time. But, it, but we know a couple of things about CAR-T responses now. We're getting a little bit smarter about this. Um, it isn't a home run in everybody. And so in this, in this analysis of who did really well with CAR-T, some of the people we would like to help, we didn't do as good with. So if you had high-risk myeloma, if you had revised stage 3 myeloma, or you had a lot of myeloma in your bone marrow before you had a CAR-T, you didn't do quite as good. You didn't hit that complete remission, meaning you didn't have control as long as you would like. Now, the, let's go to Silta cell. Silta cell, right out of the bat, had what appears to be a higher response rate. So I said about 80% at the highest level for Ida cell. Uh, this one has close to 95% uh, when it was first released and a very high percentage of people going into remission and having this minimal residual disease negative, a term I probably some people are familiar with, um, which I won't go into right now. And when this data was followed up recently, it looked even better, 98%, which people were pretty excited about. Um, and a lot of those people going into remission. And then if you look at the duration of response, in other words, how long is it lasting? How long before you might need something else? It looked like more than, uh, or almost three quarters of the patients at two years didn't need any other treatment, which was really quite exciting. So this has raised the question is, is there really a difference between these two? And some patients have said, well, should I hold out for one over the other? And I think at least the recommendation I can give you on October 15th, 2022, if you're looking to get a CAR-T, you probably should get whatever you can get, because that has been the biggest challenge right now. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. 
One of the things I'm excited about, there are so many more of these products under development. So this is just a partial list of different types of CAR T's that are being developed. So again, if you are trying to find a CAR T, I would certainly seek out one of, a, a trial if you can find one because these appear to be getting better and better at fighting myeloma. Um, one of the other things that just came out, this is an announcement that occurred about a month ago, is it might be better to do a CAR T much earlier in your myeloma journey. In other words, if you've had a couple of types of treatment, now it may be that you want to do a CAR T right away. So this was just very, really no data, but just saying that the earlier use of CAR T looked better than standard chemotherapy. We don't know any more information except what, I, what I'm showing you here, but we expect to know some details about this trial in the next, uh, uh, next few months. So what are the limitations about CAR-T? Well, one of the things that I think uh, we do know is it doesn't work in everybody. And um, I'm sure you've heard stories, Jenny, uh, um, uh, through HealthTree. Um, we know that there are some people who don't seem to have an effect at all, that, that within a couple of weeks of the CAR-T, they're not doing well. Um, the other thing that we know about CAR-T is opposed to people who get treated for lymphoma or leukemia, the, it's not curative. And so it's going to be another great treatment, but it's not going to be the thing that is going to end treatment forever. At least it does not look like that. It's really, ex whoopsie, it's really expensive. It's a, about a half million uh, per transplant. And there are some I immunosuppressive and in infection risks that you have to think about as well. But really the big thing right now is access. And so uh, we cannot provide the number of people who would like to try CAR-T with a CAR-T, there just aren't enough, uh, there are manufacturing issues that have come up, uh, not with quality, but really quantity. And so that has been a big, big limitation in offering CAR-T to as many people. And that's true at every center, large and small, throughout the country right now. Okay, let's look at some of the other available treatments. Selenexer that Craig mentioned. So I, I am also a Selenexer uh, fan, I have to say, because this is a drug that works differently than everything else. It helps sort of retain a good of cancer-fighting uh, enzymes in the cell to help, to help uh, uh, slow down the growth of myeloma. But it, it, you can't take too much of it, and I think that's really the secret. And you also can't take it by itself to have the best effect. And this is just a study done with Selenexer in combination with carfilzomib and dexamethasone. And uh, these are all people who had many, many types of treatment. So this is all reduction of their myeloma uh, proteins. So it looks pretty good. About three quarters of people responded to this. And this also includes people who had failed CAR-T and other BCMA-targeted therapies. So this is something that I think uh, it may end up being adapted more often. OK, so let's talk about bispecific engagers. So this is a class of drugs not here yet, but probably very, very soon coming. So how these work is uh, basically sort of like, a, I, I sometimes say, like a, 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 poor, a poor man's CAR-T, because you are still engaging an immune cell here and pulling it to a, a, a plasma cell to help kill it. And this, again, most of these are targeting BCMA again, that protein that I mentioned. Probably the one that is closest to approval is a drug called teclistimab. Teclistimab is, it is given subcutaneously. Um, it can cause some side effects like other CAR-T products can with this cytokine release syndrome. And then it goes from these tiny doses up to what's a once a weekly dose. Um, it tends to be given with some steroids early on to prevent that cytokine release, but you can drop them out later on. And I think people are very excited because this slide is just to tell you that it was tested in people who had had many, many, many types of treatments already. Response rates look pretty good. So, so they are about 60 to 70 percent depending on the trial and many of those people are doing quite well with the drug so if you look at what what is whoopsie excuse me very exciting here what we call median duration of response that means that there are people on this drug that are still responding and haven't needed to change uh, there also is sort of a tantalizing possibility that this might be a drug that you can stop and start and don't have to take continuously we'll see if that turns out to be true and this is outpatient treatment then there is another one of these drugs in this class. This is called telketamab. This is a little farther away. This is probably maybe a couple of years out. Uh, this is another bispecific engager. So you know the drug binds that immune cell, brings it over to the myeloma cell. 
very high response rates. Again, it can be used in people who have had these BCMA-targeted therapies and seems to be effective. Um, great response rates. Uh, again, this is another subcutaneous drug. Um, it has some very special side effects because the target of this drug is not just confined to myeloma cells. It is actually found uh, involving nail and hair production. So one of the things that can happen is people can get some nail side effects. Now this is obviously not life-threatening, but annoying, and you can use things like Sally Hansen's hard as nails to try to uh, help with that, but that is, a, that is a, a side effect that's pretty common. There's also a drug called Sevastimab that is targeting another protein on myeloma called FCRH5. Uh, this drug is another bispecific, again, tested out in people who've had many, many treatments, also has pretty good response rates, about 60%. Now you can say none of these that I've shown you are 100%, but it helps you sort of figure out if, you, if we think of myeloma treatment sometimes as a kind of chess game where you've got to make a move and you've got to have several moves in your back pocket is what you're going to do next. I think these are all going to be very, very helpful in the future. This is a whole list of these drugs, a couple of I mentioned, but more that are on the way. And I think this is a strategy we're going to see a lot of in myeloma in the future. So let's talk a little bit about other drugs that are on the way. These are called cell mods. This is a really a mouthful, Cerebron E ligase modulator. So basically, you can think of these drugs as cousins of pomalidomide and lenalidomide. They are oral. They're given the same way that those drugs are given, usually three weeks out of four. And they've been tested in people who are resistant to both pomalidomide and lenalidomide. And just like what we always do in myeloma, it's been tested by itself and has about a 40% response rate when combined with steroids. But it's being combined with a whole lot of other drugs and looks pretty good. These trials using abiratamide uh, are open. They, they might be available to somebody who might be uh, thinking about this. There's also another cell mod drug called mesigdamide or mezi that looks even better perhaps than abiratamide. There is the expectation that abiratamide is going to be approved, I think, probably within a year, which would be great because, again, it's another a drug, it's oral, and it will be convenient and particularly helpful if, it, if it's, uh, you're the person who responds to it. I just want to mention venetoclax. So venetoclax is a drug that is FDA approved, but not in myeloma. So it's approved in chronic lymphocytic leukemia and lymphoma. But about 20% of myeloma people have in their myeloma cells what's called a translocation of 1114. And this means that they are potentially very responsive to this drug venetoclax, which is an oral medicine. This one's taken every day. But uh, a couple of years ago, people found out that in this subset of people using venetoclax with some steroids, there was about four out of 10 people who responded. But now what happens is that if we take one of our familiar drugs, daratumumab here, and combine it with venetoclax, that's a really good response rate, 90%. And this is in people who've had many other types of treatment. But again, it's only really right now at least looking like the people who have this 1114 translocation should consider this kind of combination. But this is something that you could consider getting now if you're in that situation. Then uh, really sort of out there, many people may have, how many people have had daratumumab or on daratumumab? Or isatuximab too? Okay, anybody resistant to that that they know of? Anybody the daratumumab isn't working yet or has stopped working? Okay, oh, okay. So this drug is very interesting, uh, Modacafusp, which also has sort of a cool name, but this is an anti-CD38 antibody, but it's combined with an old drug, interfe alpha interferon, that is something that we used in the 80s to treat myeloma. But what we think we're gonna be able to do with this drug is actually sort of retarget CD38, but bring in a new person to the party, the alpha interferon, so this drug is being tested in people who've had lots of different treatments. Um, the response rate here by itself is only about four out of 10, but this drug is once a month IV, which would be pretty nice. And it's gonna be combined with daratumumab, uh, which seems sort of counterintuitive, but, but we think it's gonna help resensitize to daratumumab. And again, this was tested out in people who failed a lot of other treatments. So I think that is one to watch. Now, um, I don't want to say that we're all incompetent, which is the picture here, but one of the things about these new therapies that I told you about, we don't really know what the best order to put them in or what we tend to call sequence. So there have been sort of uh, rumors going around that perhaps if you've had belantamab or Blenrep, you shouldn't go on to get a CAR-T transplant, or maybe you should have a bispecific and then get a CAR-T. We just don't know yet. 
So we don't know what the best order of these drugs is. The other thing is we don't know if it should be the same in every person. And as you know from Jenny's wonderful work here, there are a lot of differences between people with myeloma. Sometimes people are stable six months and sometimes they're stable six years. So I think we're gonna have to figure out how to work with all these drugs and make them make sense for, for every individual patient. And that's why you putting in your data to HealthTree is so important so that we can kind of use that and figure out just questions like this that we don't know. Okay, and just in conclusion, I, I hope that you uh, feel there are gonna be a ton of options for myeloma, even if a person has had many, many treatments. I would definitely recommend if you are looking at your third or fourth relapse, trying to join a clinical trial is often a really good idea because that tends to give you access to new drugs that you otherwise can't get. And if it doesn't work, okay, it doesn't work. Typically what a clinical trial is gonna ask you is more time. Um, and, and we know that, and unfortunately, that is, it's hard to get around that because often we're taking, looking at safety, but the payoff can be very, very great. Uh, having somebody reevaluate you at the time that you may relapse, I think it's very, very important. And then if you are considering CAR-T, you really need to have a, the person that's helping to treat you, have you think about that early on, because at least right now, those lists to get access are very long. So I'm going to stop, and thank you very much. Thank you.